My mission is and the silence, the stigma and the shame about suicide, loss, ideation, and mental health. Please, will you join me? Welcome to Suicide Zen Forgiveness, a podcast that shares powerful stories of suicide loss, ideation, and mental health in order to break the silence, stigma, and shame. Our mission is to encourage empathy for those experiencing these challenges. Every narrative serves as a beacon of hope, want to touch lives and inspire resilience. Won't you join me in this journey as we share stories to help others to find hope? Please note, this podcast is for educational purposes and may contain triggering content. If you're grieving or experiencing mental health issues, Please reach out to your local suicide hotline or mental health office for immediate help. And now, let's start the show. My guest is Brenda Adelman. She's an award-winning actress and playwright, and the daughter of a Jewish father and an art mother. She grew up in the Mill Basin section of Brooklyn, New York. She's a fan of Broadway shows since the kid. And she studied acting at several prestigious schools in London, New York, and Los Angeles. Not all a happy story. Brenda's mother, an award-winning artist and photographer, shot and killed in her home in Brooklyn, New York, in 1995. Brenda's father pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter and served two and a half years in prison. What is most confusing about this story is that within days of her mother's death, her father contacted her mother's older sister, ended up being there for him. In a very peculiar way. He, he moved in with her. And some time later, he got married. Brenda helps people with forgiveness. Uh, I think she makes a perfect person to be doing that. So please, join and so without further ado, I want to present to you my guest today, Brenda Adelman. Brenda, it's so lovely to have you here with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Exciting. You have, you have a lot of accolades behind your name, and I find so much of what you do so incredibly different. But we're going to talk about... I guess what brought you to some of the work you do with forgiveness, which I think is really important and a subject that can be really difficult for people within the space of suicide law and mental. So I'm going to just let you dive in where you'd like to and give us your Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Let me start here. I have a one woman show about my life story. That's a stage presentation that I've performed all over the world. It's based on my story for the event in my life that changed everything, which was that my father, who I adored, I was daddy's little girl, even though I was an adult when this happened, he shot and killed my mother in 1995. And then within months moved in with my aunt, my mother's sister before marrying her and the interesting thing having to do with suicide prevention and all those kind of things is that I learned early on that even though my show what it's about is the power of forgiveness self-forgiveness setting healthy boundaries is that when I would do the show in front of audiences I would immediately get feedback from people who had suicides in their family where they never talked about the person. There was a lot of shame around it. And there was something in my show that 
healed them and helped them bring their loved one to life in dialogue. And I couldn't understand it at first because I was like, that's, I mean, it was amazing. And then of course I realized, oh, I also talk about the fact that I wanted to take my life after that happened. I was so depressed and it wasn't a main theme to me. And yet it resonated for so many people. I just, I'm going to stop you for one second because all of that rings so true. And the, the other thing is very often when we lose someone to suicide, either it takes a really long time or we don't realize that there's an underlying way to forgive the person we lost. That is, I think, the key to what you do. Thank you. And I hope that, that that's really helpful because while in my piece, I don't talk about someone else committing suicide. The end of my piece is about total self-forgiveness for whatever I've done, whatever I've felt in my case, wanting to kill my father and all this other stuff and forgiving myself for trusting him, but he was my father. So I wasn't able to save my mother, but there is that underlying thing and foundational is that I must release this shame. I must release this feeling like I'm damaged. And in that is also, I must forgive my father or my mother the judgments I have so that I can be free of them. So maybe there's something in there where it's even unconscious that they're forgiving that person. That's beautiful. It's so true. And it's so, it's so interconnected with some of the other feelings that we have that I think it's probably some people didn't realize it was even part of what they were feeling, perhaps until they saw you. Yes, because of the, yeah, because of the, the shame, because of the silence and the stigma surrounding suicide, so many people say nothing. They, they don't say their name. We have a wall about saying their name. Because so many people have stopped. They don't talk about that person. It's like they never existed. Yeah. I think that's heartbreaking. Yeah, this reminds me, because since doing my show, I've also, I teach storytelling. I teach owning our stories, healing from our stories, and then sharing it publicly. And I had a woman in my class, class I used to do called Healing Through Story, and she, her mother had committed suicide like 10 years before. And when she came into my class and she came in to learn a story for business, she sold essential oils. She could never say the word suicide. And by the end of the six weeks, not only could she say it, so she believed herself of whatever she was making that mean. First of all, we realized that her business selling essential oils was because she felt like the uh, medicine her mother was taking caused it. So that was purpose for her. But she also, before we even did the showcase for the, the class, she called one of her mother's friends and did her eight minute piece for her. And it was like tears and bringing her mother alive and stuff like that. So beautiful. Uh, it is. It's so beautiful when you are able to bring that person back into your orbit, if you will, into your family. And there's so much has changed. So much still needs to change because there is still so much stigma and so much silence and shame around all of it. And it's interesting because I was so touched by your story the first time you and I spoke. It never occurred to me that you might feel shame. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, and I, I'm really struck by that because. Uh, shame is such a, a motivator when it comes to suicide loss and, and other things in our lives. It just absolutely never occurred to me. And, and that, that had to be really hard for you. Yeah, the shame came from feeling like damaged goods also. I felt like I was, it was before I had done the inner work and I got, went on to get a master's degree in spiritual psychology so I can understand what happened. And not only that, but how could I thrive despite it? So yeah, I wanted to hide because I felt dirty and damaged because my father mother. And then I felt shame around not being able to save my mother. Like I said, trust 
my father, even though I was daddy's little girl, we grew up to trust our fathers. And like it was a lot of self-love and self-care and reframing and reparenting myself and being the father, embracing the wonderful masculine qualities and just applying them to myself so that I could let go of anything I ever wanted or needed or what I thought I needed from my father. And that's something that I think is also really interesting because we didn't speak for long the first time. Uh, In everything I've seen and read of yours, there is no rancor. You have truly forgiven. And I think that's not something I see all the time. A lot of people say they have forgiven. Uh, A lot of us have tried to forgive, but you really have. Yeah, I think it's because this is what I learned a long time ago. First of all, and you know this, forgiveness is a journey. And I feel like maybe there's an arrogance that we have. Our ego is, I've forgiven. I've done it all, right? Because I've definitely encountered people like that. But the reason I laugh about it is because I used to be that person. And then the universe would be like, oh, yeah? Let me give you Then I feel like while we're in this body, there'll be more things to let go of. However, with my father, I have forgiven because I know what it means. It's to degrees, but it's I've let go of that resentment inside or like feeling righteous or feeling even though he's passed. I actually did a lot of this forgiveness before he died. I let go of needing anything from him. And I also had this insight that after I did some study of psychology that I don't necessarily like to talk about labels, but it is easier to understand. Yeah. He's a narcissist with sociopathic tendencies. So me expecting him to take responsibility to make things right for me is ridiculous for me. That's just self-punishment. So I, if, if I have a message to share with people, it's like, Oh my gosh, if we could let go of needing anything from the person who hurts or harmed you, you will free yourself. Because some of them cannot, it's not even possible unless there was some divine intervention and, and, and a dire need to take responsibility. They cannot give you what you need to fill yourself up and be whole. That's an inside job. And when I learned, when I realized that, oh, there was freedom. Oh, it's my job. Despite being hurt, not condoning, but it's my job to feel better. It's my job to to do what I can to be the best version of myself. It has nothing to do with this person. I'm not giving them space in my mind and heart anymore. So it was freeing. And being that it's my father, I had that. I had this huge insight that if I hated any part of him, I was hating a part of myself. And I wasn't going to do that anymore. Oh, that is so important. And my spiritual advisor once told me, you have to let go of expectations. You have no right to expect anything from anyone. I know. It's a real be let down. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is that no one can make you feel anything. Your right. feelings are your own. A lot of people don't want to accept that. It's like we don't own our feelings. I know. We pass them off to everybody else who makes us feel good or makes us feel bad or sad or whatever. And it is such a mind bend when you figure out that, oh, nobody can really make me feel anything. I know. You could have a reaction in the moment to what someone has, but then... We are so much stronger than we give ourselves credit for. Like it, it, it's an inside job. It's an yeah. inside job. Because if someone's making you happy or you think they're making you happy, not that you can't be happy when you're around them, but if you really think they're the source of it, then when they leave, you're screwed. The better. Yeah. yeah. It's more like the body, that feeling that you get when you're around that person that you can have more of it when you're on your own and give more of that feeling. And then if you think someone is the source of your pain, it's really fine tuning. If you're around someone, let's say, who you just get triggered by it. If you actually look at it as, oh my God, this person is giving me insight into what parts of myself 
still need loving instead of how dare they, then you can like just be, have more peace and freedom. So, so that's absolutely brilliant and does really turn everything on its head because I think we are so used to attributing everything to everybody outside of us and funny, but that's a very narcissistic thing. It is. That's why if you actually realize like when you're, I did that a few years ago, I was like, okay, I am seeing narcissism in my father, seeing narcissism in this ex and this and that. Where is it present in me? Because we have everything present in us. So if you're like, that person is doing this to me, they're hurting me, but oftentimes they're not doing it to hurt. Like my father, he didn't do that to hurt me. He did it for, for mental illness, for all kinds of things. But and I'm being pretty self-centered. Like the world is just about me. But can we love the narcissistic tendencies within us? But I think we first have to acknowledge them. We do. And I find a lot of people don't want to because we want, we think it's bad. Just like we don't want to be the victim. But the problem is when we don't want to be the victim, we end up being the victim, which makes us disempowered. But if people could see that we have, we do, we're humans, we have all of it in us. And if we did not judge it, we can handle it, but not judge it. Be amazing. But people want to feel good about themselves. So I find this was me too. I find people, I was going to do a workshop on this years ago, but I didn't. I find people identify more with the victim when they're unconscious or sometimes that's the victim or the bully, right? Yeah. And the people who identify more as the victim can somehow, or they have a story that is, I'm a good person. Look what that person has done, but I'm a good person. Whereas the people who identify as a bully, they're still, they don't have that. They have other things that they're, that are working around them. Like they you can't do bad things and not know that you're doing them. So they have other things, but the person who is, you know, but they don't want to be a victim because then they think the victim is weak, but they're weak because they're not validated on them on their own. You know what I'm saying? So it's interesting because I find that a lot of people, and I get, I identified more as the victim, like my mother, because yeah. I look, what did she do? But it's disempowering. It's like, it's disempowering to identify with one or the other. We are full integrated people, but I find that with the victim, people sometimes hold on to it like it's something precious and not realizing, and this was me, not realizing that is disempowering you and everybody around you. Absolutely. You're speaking to <laughs> the victim. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, it, it was, it was a hell of an aha moment when I realized that there's only one common denominator. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. If we're attracting, I'll, I'll speak for myself and my language. My dad was a narcissist. And then I was attracting relationships that were like that when I started dating again, ironically, right? After that happened. But it was familiar. It was familiar. Hunters <laughs> at the time. But then, yeah, who was the common denominator? It was me. So it's not about beating ourselves up. Oh, so that was the thing I was going to say. I think sometimes people don't forgive to the level that they can, because they think I forgave this already. And then when something comes up and they're angry, they beat themselves up for that being like, I should have known better instead of, no, this is another deeper to love yourself more. I find it, I find it so interesting, all of what you're saying. And I, I totally get you do work with forgiveness for people and you had mentioned when we talked something about your top five reasons. Yeah, the top reasons to never forgive them why you must. I have a free e-course that I can give to listeners. So we'll get them off the top of my head. So these came from me doing uh, many workshops in person when I first started coaching back in 2006-ish. And the last, you know, oh my God, like, decade, I've been focused on storytelling and healing from our stories, but I focused on forgiveness at first, forgiveness of healthy boundaries. And some of the things people would say were, it was just too horrible what happened to me. Uh, one of the reasons to never forgive. And of course, in the workshop, I would offer why 
it's not condoning what happened ever because things are horrible. I've worked with hundreds of people, like horrible. I would say much more, har- like it's all relative, right? But much more horrible than what's happened to me because it was something that happened directly to them. But the problem is that our thoughts are things and they create our life. So if you say you cannot forgive because it's just too horrible what happened to you or a loved one, then you're right. And you can't forgive. So you live an unforgiving life. So that part of you that is angry, that's holding on, that is unloving, is fearful, is angry, is always going to be there and not open to more love, more care, more trust. Because how you are, like that peace will never be open. My definition of forgiveness is letting go of the resentment that you hold inside yourself and wishing, hoping, praying it were, was going to be different because it's never going to be different, but you are the one holding, it on, holding on to it. So that's why setting healthy boundaries is so important because it's very hard to forgive someone, especially if they're still in your life. If you think mistaking, mistakenly because what you learned at church or wherever that you forgive, you forget, and you just are a doormat and you let this person do the same thing to you. You don't. You, the person must take responsibility if they want to be in your life again. The person must have remorse. And if they don't, then you set a boundary and you spend no time with them or very little time with them. If you have to spend time with them, you don't forgive. And that's, that's stupid to me. Yeah. That yeah. It's, no. Why would you? But you're not ever condoning and letting yourself be treated like that again. But what you are doing is forgiving the anger and the resentment inside of you. Give it back to them. (laughs) Yeah. So that's one of them. That's one of the things. Another thing was that if I forgive them, they're going to hurt me. And again, that's setting healthy boundaries. So those are just two of them. And there's three more as well. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. And as, as everyone knows, all the information will be down below the podcast. As gonna end, in the e-course, I actually give a story around each of those and I give practical exercise to shift it. Oh, that's brilliant. I should have found you years ago. My marketing. Yeah, yeah. Good marketing. It's interesting to me because I'm, past, I'm way past being a victim. Because I've done the work and it does definitely take work. But it was interesting in forgiving the policeman that caused my accident. It took me a very long time. But I what was under the mis- and What happened? I was crushed between three cars on a highway. I was standing between the cars with the policeman and he dove into the snowbank and saved himself. And I lost part of my leg and I was almost seven months pregnant and they took my child. I had multiple internal injuries, long big story. But the policeman, I was on the road. I was already on the road because we couldn't pull off the road. And he dove into the snowbank. And it's really funny because as I began to remove myself from victim state, the universe gives you what you need. And I was at a, I was at a one day workshop and I drifted off. It was almost lunchtime and I drifted off in my head and I was thinking about my granddaughter at 12, we were in a zombie house at Halloween and this butcher, a zombie butcher came out from behind the table towards us with a cleaver. I immediately, my 12 year old granddaughter. And used her as a shield. Now, I love her more than life itself. And at the time, I'm holding on to her and in my head saying, it was wrong. What are you doing? And when we got out of there, it was so bizarre because I knew it was just pretend. But Uh, my lizard brain took over and wanted me to survive. And I'm replaying this in my head. This is like 10 or 12 years later. I'm sitting in this all day workshop and at lunchtime, I'm sitting there thinking, oh, was, that was so weird. And all of a sudden, this one came into my head. Wow. I'm like, oh my God. And he had a child. His body, his lizard brain saved him. Wow. He didn't get a chance to think about me. Okay. Yeah. That- 
some people are cut out to be heroes and some people are not. Obviously, I'm not. But wow. was he. And from that moment, I forgave him because he didn't do it on purpose. Wow. I had this whole big assumption. We make up these big stories. Wow. That is gorgeous. That is beautiful and heart opening. That's what I was saying. We have all of it in us. And that's why sometimes like we want that person to say they're sorry and all this stuff, but it wasn't going to bring your leg back. Nope. It wasn't going to bring my mother back. And I wanted my father to say he was sorry. Oh, I murdered your mother. It's so delusional in a way what we think we want from people. Yeah. But then when I really thought about our psyches, like you're talking about the lizard brain and stuff like that. And when I think about bullies and I think about my father in this circumstance, he had to do whatever he had to do psychically to have himself be okay with what he did. So why would he ever take responsibility to the person he hurt the most? He couldn't. It was not in his makeup. Because he's doing his survival thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting process. I found out something recently that really made me sad. So sometimes there's still more healing to do, or maybe there's more loving. But one of my cousins, so my father married my aunt after he pulled my mother, shot and killed her, shot her in the head, killed her. And a story for another time, there was a big rift in my family. Yeah. And her kids, I don't know, it seemed like, I don't know, behind any, I don't really know. That what goes on with people. With my aunts, I could say she was poor. My father had a lot of money. People make decisions all the time for their own survival and whatever. So after this happened, I stopped speaking to my father. I stopped speaking to my aunt. And then my father, uh, my father ended up skipping town because my brother and I took him to court for wrongful death after he got out of prison in two and a half years. And he skipped town and went to Florida where people hide their money and there's all this safe havens. So my brother and I wanted $2 million judgment, but they hit the money. And, but my cousin and I spoke, I don't know, let's say two years ago. And he said, I just want to tell you, Brenda, that your father didn't have a bad life after he got out of prison and went to Florida. He was in the synagogue and people liked him. But here's the thing. I was not invited to the funeral and he's, I told them to invite you, but my mom, my mother didn't want to. And it was funny because I was like, what on earth, why on earth would my cousin think I want to hear this? Because I was close with my yeah. father at the time. And then I was really upset about it. And then I was like, of course she didn't want me to come. Of course he didn't talk about me because it would expose this whole other part of his life. And as a narcissist, he could shut it down. Like I didn't know before that he would, yeah. he was that. Why would they want me to come and be like, who's this woman? Who's his, his daughter who, who I've never talked about or something like that. He's never talked about. So it was interesting. It was like another thing of, okay, let me just, we have these thoughts. I thought, oh, he had a terrible life afterwards or whatever. No, people do what they can do to survive. Of course, quietly in their own minds, who knows what happens when they oh, go to sleep. Yeah. That is such a really good point. Because like you said, some people think they've forgiven and that's the end of it. But if someone were to hear that the person that hurt them on to have a wonderful life, it could really send them all right. I think for me, what it did is I was upset. And then because I know how to heal, I just did lots of self-love. And really it was love for my inner child. I already knew my father was a narcissist. And looking at the big picture of how people do what they can do to survive and make their lives better. Who am I to be the person who's, oh, that shouldn't have happened. That's so righteous. And I know from all my inner work, that righteousness hurts me. And I'm all about empowering myself. Yeah. But it, but I also believe in a healthy release of anger. I don't believe in spiritual bypass or going right to forgive. Right. I teach my clients and I also, it's, you need to have a healthy way to release the anger because if you go right to forgiveness, 
it will come out in a different way. It'll come out to someone who's close to you that doesn't deserve your anger. It will come out as you shutting down with people, lack of intimacy. So you want to, whether it's journaling or doing something, going to a therapist, you want to give voice. That is hurt. hurts. I'm angry. Before you go to the next place, I, I have a book. My father killed my mother and married my aunt, Forgiving Unforgivable, which has my three-step process in it. Because what I realized was I did not, I went, I went back when it happened, I went right to forgiveness, like a lot of people do. And it was that anger release that needed to be addressed that would have helped me out of depression sooner. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that also will be available. A link to Brenda's book will also be available on the page with all the information about Brenda. That is it's such an incredible point because... I find it's something that we don't know how to do. We don't know how to deal with our feelings. Feelings and emotions are meant to flow and go. We don't. We hang on to everything so tightly. Yeah. And I'm a big David Attenborough fan. Attenborough. He, I think it was him. Somebody once did a thing on the antelope or gnu or whatever in the savannah. And they were all in their herd. The ones on the periphery are looking out for lions. Their head goes up every so often. And then one will catch sight or a, a lion or what have you. And all of them suddenly run like hell. And they run and run. And then they get to a safe place and they all stop. But if you watch the animals here, every single one of those animals from tip to tail they shimmy off that emotion, all the cortisol and all the, oh, all the and stuff that's running through their body. They shake it off because those things are meant to flow and go. And yeah. if they kept them, they couldn't go on doing. They couldn't be vigilant. They couldn't eat without being in a panic all the time. And I think we people need to learn that all of our emotions, good, bad, indifferent don't like calling them bad, but we need to learn to shake them off, let them go. It's so true because when you don't, when you don't consciously get it out, because I went for my two-year master's degree in spiritual psychology, I still didn't get all my anger out. And I went for a high green workshop, which really did get it out because watching the other people access that and there was a wonderful facilitator. But how many of us know people who just talk about the injustice of something that has happened to them over and over again, or they've stopped talking about that. So they decide to talk about the injustice of the world over and over again, or something that really doesn't matter. Something <laughs> someone did, you don't even know, but it's because they have that anger caught in themselves. And rather than look at maybe their personal life or, or the person they're angry with or themselves, especially people don't want to look at the anger toward themselves, right? Cause they feel like they're going to die. That's why it's so important. <laughs> Get the help you need to discover maybe you have anger at yourself. So instead of squashing it, you look at it, you do it with a lens of self-love. You do it with a, a lens of self-care that you did the best you could so that you're not ever beating yourself up. That is so good. Mm, that's so good. I suggest that if you have anything, you have unresolved any expectations anything you're dragging around with you or leaving that you think you haven't dealt with and you need to check out with Brenda so many things are going through my head right now a lot of things I have worked on a lot of things I still have to work on so thank you for that I thank you so much for joining me today I know your your time is limited I want to ask you what's what little tip tweak or habit you use daily that helps you to stay on your correct path so you know what i've been doing recently actually is i've been doing an exercise to help with my vagus nerve vagus nerve which calms it if i wake up with anxiety or i find myself with anxiety or i find myself triggered because believe me i'm a i am a spiritual being having a human experience, but I have a very human experience from time to time. We're all in this world. I put my hands on my heart and I say, I am safe. 
I am loved. I'm okay. And I got that from Mel Robbins. Dave, I'm okay. I am loved. For five minutes. It's amazing to just calm your whole body down. Because how can you really, how can we really make calm, wise decisions, inspired, take inspired actions when our nervous system is like all over the place? And we're in a world that is, is designed to, to disturb this, the calmness, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. It's always a learning experience. I believe the, every opportunity you get, you should. There's a lot out there. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I just have so much to think about. I have to say thank you. I, just my whole head is buzzing. Hey, oh, you're so good. You have so much. Thanks, Thanks for that. Absolutely. And we can come back again, and you and I can. Cover some other topics because I think you have an absolute wealth of knowledge. You I would absolutely love to. I love going deep with this. My mission is to help hundreds of thousands of people to heal, whether it's through forgiveness or through owning their stories and sharing them so people don't feel so alone. So thank you so much for giving me the platform. Thank you so much for to our audience always. I hope you got what you needed today from myself and remember to make the very most of your today every day and we're going to see you next time thank you for being here for another inspiring episode of Suicide Zen Forgiveness we appreciate you tuning in please subscribe and download on your favorite service and check out SZF's YouTube channel or Facebook community if you have the chance to leave a five-star rating or review, it'd be greatly appreciated. Please refer this to a friend you know who may benefit from the hope and inspiration from our guests. Suicide Zen Forgiveness was brought to you by the following sponsors. Truel Social Media, the digital integration specialists. Let them get you rocking page one in the search results. Canada's keynote humorist, Judy Croon, motivational speaker, comedian, author, and stand-up coach at Second City, Judy has been involved for over a decade in the City Street Outreach Program in Toronto. The ultimate podcasting hack. This is great for you if you're just starting your podcast or if you've been running it for a while. It's filled with tools, templates, and trainings for starting, growing, and monetizing your podcast. Get access to time-saving system strategies for accelerating your process at each step. Find new connections and collaborations in the uplifting podcasting community. I look forward to seeing you there. Do you have a story to share? Do you know someone you think would be a great guest? Please go to szf42.com. And for our American listeners, that's szf42.com. Thank you for listening, and we hope to see you again.